firing on three houses launches in just a couple days and it's understandable not everyone is going to be fully informed on all the new features. This video will act as your last minute cram session so you aren't caught off guard before you start teaching your students all the wrong things. I'll try to cover as many things as I can briefly but to get the full understanding we're all just going to have to play the actual game. Three houses has a lot to offer so let's get started. First off, to explain the story situation, I will be discussing things shown in the official trailers of the game. The only important reveal of the plot is what the 2019 E3 trailer showcased. It has not been secret at all, but as a fair warning, I will mention those events. Now the gist of the story is that it's set on the continent of Fodland, which is divided into three areas. To the south is the Adrestian Empire, to the north is the Holy Kingdom of Fargus, and to the east is the Leicester Alliance. Long ago, the continent was imbued in war until the divine Seros received a gift from the goddess. In the present, the Church of Seros is the main religion of Fodland, and it's said the goddess watches from above. You play as the game's main protagonist, Byleth, who can either be male or female, with no other customization options besides changing their name. Byleth is the child of Geralt, who leads a mercenary troop, and through some series of events, Byleth is offered a teaching position at the Garrig Mach Monastery. This monastery is located in the middle of the continent and is the main base of the Church of Seros. Oh yeah, your father used to be the former captain of the Knights of Seros. Anyway, the monastery also houses the Officer's Academy, which trains the future leaders from all three nations. As this is happening, Byleth also meets Sothis, a girl only they can see. I'm sure she's going to be important for the plot of the game. As a professor of the Officers Academy, you will have to choose a class of students to teach. There are three houses, the Black Eagles, the Blue Lions, and the Golden Deer. The Black Eagles represent the Adrestian Empire and is led by Edelgard, the future heir. Said to house a lot of nobles, you can meet Hubert, Ferdinand, Linhart, Casper, Bernadetta, Dorothea, and Petra. The Blue Lions represent the Kingdom of Fargus and is led by Prince Dimitri. Here you can meet Dedu, Felix, Ash, Sylvain, Mercedes, Annette, and Ingrid. The Golden Deer reigned from the Leicester Alliance and is led by Claude, the future leader of the Alliance. Here you can meet Lorenz, Raphael, Ignatz, Lysinthia, Marianne, Hilda, and Leone. It's going to be a tough choice, especially when you don't know anything about these characters. Luckily, the beginning of the game will let you walk around and talk with all the students, so you have a chance to at least meet them before you must select a house. Depending on who you choose will affect the story and should encourage you to play through this game multiple times. Moving on to a main portion of the game, the monastery will be where you get to run around and interact with all these students. This is a completely new feature for Fire Emblem and certainly holds high ambitions. There is a calendar system in place for the academy portion of the game with seasons basically representing a month. In a season, on the weekdays you'll train your students and on the weekend you'll have free time to roam around the monastery and that's where you can do all kinds of fun stuff. At the end of a month, you must pass a required battle and those are most likely similar to your normal Fire Emblem chapters where you're probably going to advance the plot. During your gig as a professor, you'll give your students their own specialized training routines by determining what area of combat they should focus on. These are called skills, and each character has their own set of strengths and weaknesses. Skills include swords, lances, axes, bows, and gauntlets, which are all weapons. Reason is offensive magic and split into dark magic and black magic. Meanwhile, faith is white magic, which involves healing skills. Authority is needed for battalions, which we will discuss later. As for heavy armor, riding, and flying, these involve different types of classes. While you are not forced to make every student only study the skills they are proficient in, they will get you more experience if you do. If you make a student study something they are weak in, you are really going to have to focus on that skill, which may take a long time. Students also have hidden talents in certain skills, and if you train them enough in that skill, they can unlock special abilities, so that can be a fun thing to chase. These are marked by three stars. In past Fire Emblem games to increase your weapon skill for swords, you basically just use swords more in combat, but in three houses, you actually don't get as much experience from just fighting. They are really putting a focus on the teaching aspect, so you have to keep track of that. Teaching duties come in the form of one-on-one -on -one instruction, group activities, and setting goals for students to learn on their own. If you want to only focus teaching one student, and they will gain more skill levels, but you only have a limited amount of actions for the one-on-one -on -one instructions, and students have motivation levels, so studying too much may be bad. Once you are done, you start the week, and students will automatically gain experience in the skills you set for them to study. Students can also give you requests to train in certain skills, and it's up to you whether you allow it. 
Now the main point of all this teaching is so that your students can pass certification exams and this is the classic Fire Emblem promotion system. All characters have a certain class and throughout the game you'll go from basic classes to intermediate, advanced, and even master tier classes. To promote to a new class, a unit must take a certification exam and those ask you to have a certain skill level or even multiple ones. If you meet the requirements, I believe you'll have a 100% pass rate, but if you do not, your chances of passing go down. You also need a specific item to take these exams and I'm not sure how abundant those are so I wouldn't gamble on a 50% pass rate. Different classes have different proficiencies, and I think this got a lot of people confused. So generally, when you see these class screens in Fire Emblem games, they tell you what weapons the class can equip. In Three Houses, things are a bit different. You can equip most weapons in any class, with some exceptions like riders cannot use gauntlets and magic is limited to certain classes. These skills on screen tell you what the class is proficient in, which means they'll gain extra experience for skill levels when using those weapons in combat. So I can still have my armored knight running around with gauntlets, but he won't gain as much experience compared to a brigand. That's okay though, because you can supplement that lower XP gain by just focusing on gauntlets more when you're teaching them. Also, characters can swap to any class they have the certification for at any time outside of battle. As you can see, the system is super flexible and leaves a ridiculous amount of room for customization. Classes do affect stat growth from what I know, so keep that in mind, and more advanced classes will gain certain class-only abilities which are essentially passive effects. There are also character-specific abilities and abilities tied to skill levels. The class abilities are only for specific classes, but you can mix and match skill level abilities. It's pretty daunting, I will admit, but you have a lot of customization options. You are free to let the game auto-instruct your units, but I have no clue how that will turn out for you. Besides teaching and passing exams, you can do other activities in the monastery. On the weekend, you have some options. You can explore, hold a seminar, actually go to a battle, or rest. We will circle back around to explore because there are a lot of options for that one. Seminars let you teach your students like you normally do on the weekdays. Battles are optional fights where you can go and level up your units or complete optional missions which are known as paralogues in Fire Emblem. These may offer some deeper story insight for some characters so they are worth looking into. If you choose the rest, you'll restore the motivation of your students so that will let you teach them more and you'll restore the durability of Violet's sword. You can only pick one of these actions so choose carefully. As for exploring the monastery, there is a wide variety of things to do. You can spend an infinite amount of time running around if you want, but to do certain activities, you need activity points, and you get more of those based on your professor level. Your professor level increases by interacting with your students, among other things. While you run around the monastery, you can fish, grow crops, and visit the market. These activities can get your ingredients, which will be used for cooking, and you can share a meal with students to increase your support relationships. Other activities include finding lost items around the monastery, signaled by blue wisp on the ground, and returning them to the right students. You can answer anonymous letters from students asking for advice, or accept quests to do things around the joint. You can even host tea parties, which include a conversation with one student. Another feature of the monastery is the Amiibo Gazebo, which grants you items and even songs to listen to, depending on what Fire Emblem character Amiibos you scan in. If you run around and find big statues, this is where you can claim rewards by spending Renown. Renown is given when you complete battles, and these statues offer some pretty good things, so please be sure to check those out as you play the game. Finally, let's talk about supports. So in Fire Emblem, when your units fight near each other, they can improve their bonds. This can lead to a small stat boost whenever those units are together on the battlefield. Three Houses steps it up by allowing you to increase support relationships in the monastery, and one way to do this is by sharing a meal with them or assigning them to the same group task. When a pair of characters have a high enough support level, they can trigger a support conversation, and these are some of the best ways to get to know more about a character. In Three Houses, all the dialogue, or at least almost all of it, seems to be fully voiced, and that was a major feature introduced in Shadows of Valentia that I really enjoyed. In this game, with the 3D models, support conversations also seem to have their own animated cutscenes, and that's pretty neat. Supports usually have multiple levels, C, B, and A, plus a special S rank. In other Fire Emblems, S rank generally leads to marriage, and while Awakening and Fates both had child units, Three Houses does not. I believe there are same-sex relationships, but I'm not sure if that only applies to Violet the Avatar. Last thing I want to touch on for the monastery is recruitment. While you may only select one house to lead, it is indeed possible to recruit students from other houses into your group. When you talk to other house students in the monastery, you may see the option to recruit them. They will ask you to meet certain requirements, similar to certification exams, except Byleth must be the one with those skills. 
They also seem to require a certain level in a particular stat category like strength or defense. Now, as far as I've seen, there doesn't seem to be a limit to how many students you can recruit from other houses. However, it also sounds like it will be very tough to recruit a large number of them just because Byleth can only have so many stat points or skill levels. If you have certain people in mind, you better start trying to work toward those levels early. Also, you cannot recruit the house leaders and apparently certain characters, which I won't mention. If you're wondering about non-student recruitments, your fellow professors can also be recruited like Manuela and Hahnemann. There are also characters who are not professors that are recruitable. There may be more characters, but that is probably spoiler territory. Moving on to combat related features, let's discuss stats. Units have a set of stats and every time they level up they can potentially get more stat points. In Fire Emblem, units have growth rates, which basically determine how likely a unit will increase a certain stat category every time they level up. Essentially, it's going to be dictated by RNG. If you've played Fire Emblem Heroes, then be aware that stat variation on a larger scale is going to be a thing. What class they are will also affect growth rates, so for example, if someone is an Armored Knight, don't expect them to get too many speed level ups. Let's quickly run through all the stats. HP is your health points, don't let that get to zero. Unlike in Heroes where units just have an attack stat, in regular games, it's split into strength and magic. Strength determines physical damage done by weapons like swords, where magic is obviously determining magical damage from spells. The defense stat reduces damage from physical damage, while res or resistance reduces magical damage. Speed determines if a unit can make a follow-up attack if their speed is a certain threshold higher than the opponent. Dex or Dexterity is replacing skill from past games. Dex will basically determine hit chance as well as how well a unit avoids enemy attacks. Luck is such a weird stat and I'm pretty sure its effect varies from game to game including affecting hit chance and crit rates. I'm not 100% what it affects in 3 houses but generally the more the better. As for Cha, I believe that stands for Charm, and that's a new stat. I've not seen a confirmation as to what Charm does, but I've read it affects battalions and possibly recruitment, but absolutely do not quote me on that. Next we'll go over Gauntlets and Magic. Gauntlets are a new weapon type and their intrinsic trait is that they allow a unit to attack twice when initiating. This is the Brave weapon effect from past games. Gauntlets look cool, but you cannot use them on a riding class like a Cavalier. As for magic, it's on a new system now. I believe anyone can use magic as long as the class they're in allows it. You just need to train them in Reason or Faith. Higher Reason or Faith skill levels will grant new spells and also increase the amount of times you can cast those spells. Spell use will be replenished between battles. Finally, we can talk about Battalions. Battalions are groups of soldiers you can assign to a character and they need a high authority skill level to wield stronger Battalions. You can purchase Battalions at the Monastery. These are the NPC soldiers you see fighting alongside your characters and they actually can lose health when your unit takes damage. Their health is showcased by the triangles near your unit's name, with 3 triangles meaning they are more than 2 thirds HP, 2 triangles being less than 2 thirds HP, and then 1 triangle is less than a third. You will need your battalion alive to unleash gambits which are special moves you can use that have a variety of effects. Some buff your allies while others do damage and they also negate counterattacks which is very useful. However, you have a limited amount of uses for gambits, so plan accordingly. If you use a gambit near allies a unit is supported with, you can get a boost to hit chance and damage. I believe you can do this with up to 3 allies. Similar to gambits, combat arts return from Shadows of Valentia. These special moves also have a variety of effects, but they would use more weapon durability. Oh yeah, if a weapon breaks, it would deal less damage, so you can't be spamming these moves all the time. Combat Arts will probably be a crucial part of battle since they include effects like granting extra damage against armored units. You learn Combat Arts through skill levels for a specific weapon and they must be used with that weapon type. Combat Arts also cannot trigger a follow up attack. In Shadows of Valentia these things were extremely powerful sometimes so I'm expecting to see some really good ones toward the end game. Now we get to a fun topic, what exactly are the Crest? Well unfortunately there are still a lot of unknown details unless you've played the game. From what we know, Crest are a symbol of power from the goddess and they can grant people certain abilities. It seems like Crest have been passed down the generations by bloodlines and they are split into Major and Minor Crest, with Major Crest being stronger. Unsurprisingly, it seems like many nobles have Crest and so a lot of the students will have them too. I have zero clue if crests are an actual physical item or what, but I suspect we see Edelgard's crest in this cutscene. In battle we have seen Violet's crest activate and it healed him based on his damage done, so most likely all crests grant extra abilities to their users. Whatever crests end up being, they will definitely be a major plot point to the story. 
Another interesting addition to the game are giant beast monsters. They take up multiple tiles on the board and are extremely powerful, having multiple bars of HP you need to take down. From preview gameplay, beasts seem to be able to unleash a powerful AoE move, although that could have just been a specific monster. Regardless, it looks like these guys are going to be major enemies when present, so you definitely want to plan out your moves before engaging them. The last thing I want to talk about regarding combat is Divine Pulse. This was also a feature from Shadows of Valentia, then named Mila's Turnwheel. Basically, Divine Pulse allows Violet to turn back time, and it does seem like it's an actual story plot point and not just a game mechanic. If you mess up and someone dies, or you miss position, you can use Divine Pulse to go back in time to an earlier action, and that can save you from resetting the whole map, which is generally what you normally do if you play on Classic Mode. You will gain more Divine Pulse uses later on in the game, but I assume it won't be a large number. To me, it's a nice feature because 1. You don't have to use it if you don't want to, and 2. If I end up restarting a map because someone died, why not save myself some time anyway? It's a nice feature for new players and veterans alike. Speaking of time, I want to discuss an important story plot that was revealed in the E3 trailer for this year. If you haven't seen it, you may want to because it's not going to be a well-kept secret, so you're, you're probably going to find out anyways. Otherwise, if you have somehow managed to avoid it and you don't want to know what it's about, then you should just turn off the internet for right now. Alright, so why are we training all these students? What's the end goal here? Turns out, at a certain point in the story, there will be a 5 year time skip. In those 5 years, it seems like everything has gone to hell and war has broken out. In the war phase of the game, you can no longer recruit other house students, however the academy portion of the game will still be available and Byleth is still with whatever house you chose. At this point, some support conversations get unlocked and you can even start to have S ranks. It also appears that this time skip will be where the major stories of choosing a house branch off into different directions. It sounds like you're going to have to face your former classmates and just in general this game is looking like it's going to be pretty somber. That hopefully covers a lot of the basic information you want to keep in mind as you get started with Fire Emblem 3 Houses. The game is looking absolutely massive so you have a lot to discover on your own. If you're a newcomer to Fire Emblem then I know all of this can seem very daunting. The monastery slash academy parts of the game is completely new to the series but so far from what I've heard from reviewers it's not that bad once you get the hang of it. I think at the very start there will be some hurdles to get used to all the new features but I'm looking forward to this new teaching business. If you've been a Fire Emblem Heroes player and you want to get into 3 houses as your first main Fire Emblem game, then you should be okay on the combat side of things, it will feel familiar just on a grander scale. Some things I want to emphasize is that again, RNG is pretty heavy in these games. There will be times where you have a 97% chance to hit and then your guy misses which screws you over. It's frustrating but on the flip side, when my healer dodges a fatal blow that has like an 80% chance to hit, you get a huge sense of relief. Not to mention, I love me some critical hits as they are always some of the best parts of these games. Another small tip is to take advantage of terrain in Heroes. Terrain mainly acts as a mobility limiter, but in main games they can provide important bonuses too. Also, weapon choice is very important. An iron sword may be weak, but it should have more durability than a steel sword and should have a higher hit chance too. I believe Three Houses also has weapon weight, which means a heavier weapon will lead to less doubles. If you can double with the Iron Sword compared to the Steel Sword, you may be better off hitting twice for more total damage. Always be sure to check the battle forecast, and remember, you can switch weapons to see different results. That's all I got for now, I'm sure I missed something. As a warning, the game has been leaked, and people already have early copies. The wait is brutal, but I'm hoping it's all worth it. Tune in here tomorrow where I'll be sharing my personal thoughts on three houses so far. It'll be a casual discussion about some of the things I'm excited for and what house I'll be going with first. Thanks for watching, I'll see you guys next time.